Well, good morning. I'm glad to be with you today here at Grace Communion Hanover. Uh, my name is Bill Wynn. I'm the lead pastor here, and um, we are meeting in person right now with some safety precautions in place, of course. And if you'd like to meet with us, we meet, uh, we begin at 1030, and we meet at 600 Green Drive in Knoxville, um, building actually. So if you would, join me uh, for a prayer. Let's pray together. And uh, let me say this first. When we pray, how you posture yourself uh, during a prayer uh, does not uh, grant you any special audience with prayers have been said in many different pictures. Soldiers in foxholes uh, prayed without bowing their church prayed looking up uh, at the throne of heaven with their hands raised. <clears throat> So uh, you pray however you feel comfortable. So, Father, we thank you that when we come to you, we're not coming to you as strangers. Uh, we're not coming to you as those who are separated from you and uh, trying to find some incantation or some magic posture that will grant us access to you or allow us into your presence. God, we thank you that, that in Jesus Christ, uh, God is Emmanuel, God with us, and we don't have to seek an absent that when we pray, we are in essence to the God who is in us, as us, with us, and for us. So thank you, Father, for being with us in the Jesus Christ Spirit. He asked on this day, or what it means that your son, your unique, your only son, became flesh. We ask the Holy Spirit that you would enlighten us, that you would share the deep, significant truths of the gospel as it relates to the word being made flesh. And we ask it by his name, the strong and powerful and mighty and glorious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, so uh, the last... Uh, times we've been in John 1 in, in the beginning of John's gospel in what's uh, we're going to begin reading in uh, in verse 14 I call for you a story that was famous uh, by the late Paul Harvey I don't know if you to Paul Harvey um, Paul Harvey was a staple around our household. In the car when uh, Paul Harvey might be on. <clears throat> and I want to think it, it serves Paul Harvey's radio program was 30 minutes long. It was very short. And he would give you a little news. He would give you a little commentary. And then he would give you the rest of the story, right? And he would tell you some wonderful story and he was a good to tell you some wonderful story that maybe you had never heard before i learned about uh, wd-40 uh, from paul harvey his name he was a chemist he was uh, you could use in industrial settings to spray on moving parts of machinery to get moisture out he was looking for a water displacement formula and he failed nine times and the 40th time, the 40th formula, successfully came up with a water displacement. That's why WD-40 is called D-40. It's water displacement 40th try. And the lesson was, if you fail, keep trying. Right? So um, one of the stories that Paul Harvey tells was about uh, on Christmas, Christmas Eve, his family go with them down to the church town, and it was we want to go and stayed home. And as he heard the church bells ring in the distance, he heard thumping on the window, and he looked out. The whole flock a little against the picture window, trying to get in out of the cold. And of course, knocked themselves and were down on the ground. And in pity, 
uh, for these little birds. He wanted to gather them up and put them in a pan inside where it was warm and care for them. And the closer they got to the birds, the more panicked they became. Flooded away, did the best they could to escape, and he was never able to help the birds. But it occurred to him how large and scary he seemed to the birds. And uh, the thought entered his mind that if he could become a bird like they were and communicate with them, their language on their level, he could explain to him that he only wanted to help. Keep that story in mind as we read in John chapter 1, verse 14. Holy Spirit, bless the reading of your word. In verse 14 of John 1, and the word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen his glory. The glory as of a father's only son, full of grace, testified to him and cried out. This was he from whom I said, who comes after me, ranks ahead of me because he was before. From his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. The law indeed was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God. It is God, the only Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, who has made him known. There's a lot there. And we're going to focus on just a couple of uh, important parts of that. It's interesting. Uh, I want you to know ahead of time that the, uh, the Greek word that's used for seen there doesn't mean laid eyes on, right? Because there's other places in the Bible where, like Moses saw God, um, Eve walked with God, um, Elijah was caught up by God in the clouds. So the, the literal uh, concept of seeing like right now, I'm seeing this camera, and you're seeing my face. Um, the the Greek word here uh, that's used for seen means to discern. That's important. Yeah. Jesus Christ, the, the Word made flesh, is the only person to ever properly discern the Father. Because he's been what? With the Father from all eternity. We talked about it. Pre face, that's right, face to face. He alone has been face to face with eternity. So who else? Who else could it be to show us the Father? So the Word became flesh and lived among us. I want you to know that the Greek word there for among can also be translated in, made his dwelling, pitched his tent in us. Jesus lives in you by the Holy Spirit. All right? We don't. Pick up the phone and call God to help us with our problem. You know, where Charlie Brown is picking up the phone and he says, Hello, God, we need your help down here. Oh, need a phone. You don't need some magic phone line to heaven. When you pray, you're not praying to some distant deity. The, the, the Latin for that is Deo Subsconditus, the hidden God. He's not hidden. He's in you, of Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit. So when you pray, you can whisper if you want to whisper. You don't have to shout that God hears you from heaven. You can think because Jesus is in you. So what does it mean that the Word became flesh and lived in us? Well, the word flesh literally means Minded. The, this, the, the Greek word sark, fully minded. Jesus, when, when the word became flesh, he became everything that it means to be a human being. So that means that he had to go to the restroom just like you do. That means that when he walked too far in his sandals, he got a blister. That means that he, his hair had to be trimmed, his hair had to be combed, or um, yeah, he got mosquito bites. He got scratched by thorns. He got hungry. He had to eat. He got thirsty. He had to drink. And it even means that had he not been 
he would have died of something. Because it is not human not to die. It's appointed for a man once to die. After this, the judgment. So even if it hadn't been the cross, Jesus would have died of old age at best. So the word became flesh, carnal minded. So what does that mean? Why is that significant? Why is that significant to the word for seen? Horah. Why, why is that significant? Why is it that it is so significant that the word was made flesh, sarks, carnally minded, and then Jesus is also the one, the only one who has properly discerned the Father? Because Jesus enters into our human condition with our carnal the capacity to see God the way we see God, but all along he knows the truth about who the Father is. So Jesus enter, you have to you have to catch this. This is important. Jesus enters into our way of seeing God with a library of information about what the Father is truly like. This is why Jesus in Matthew eleven twenty seven 27 can say to the religious leaders of the world, you have no idea who my Father is. No one knows the Father except the Son, he says. And those to whom the Father chooses to reveal. Jesus alone knows the Father. He's the only one who's ever been face to face with the Father. He came to show us the Father. The Word made him known. You know, Greek is such a condensed language, right? Like, we have these words. Um, I'm reading of the New Revised Standard. Who has made him known? That's four words. And it takes four words to convey the meaning of the one word that's used there. Think of, think of the Koine Greek language like condensed soup. When we bring it into English, we got to add a little water, right? So we add a little water to it and we come up with who has made him known. Has made him known is one word, exegemi, exegete. Jesus exegetes the Father to us. He knows who the Father is and it's not enough for Jesus to know by himself. He is not content to be the only one in the cosmos that knows the Father face to face. He you know the Father with him. That Jesus now brings you into the context of his relationship with the Father so that you can know the Father. See, you will never know the Father apart from Jesus. Your knowing of the Father will always be in the context of Jesus' relationship. It's beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Think of Jesus as your tour guide to all things God the Father. Jesus is full of grace and truth. John says that from his fullness we have received grace upon grace. Well, what does that mean? His fullness? From Jesus' fullness. The concept of fullness that is used here in this passage implies an overflowing, right? The fullness that's talked about here is a fullness that fills the cosmos, fills everything. The fullness of Jesus fills every corner of the universe. And from that fullness, what do we receive from that fullness? Grace upon grace upon grace upon grace upon grace and condemnation. No. It's just grace upon grace upon grace upon grace without condemnation. Jesus said that himself. He says, all condemnation is for me by my Father, and I condemn no one. But my Father is righteousness. The law was through Moses. Grace and came through Jesus. So why is John making a distinction between the law of Moses and grace and truth? Because he puts a but there. Some buts are bigger than other buts. And this is one of those big buts. But 
grace and truth came through Jesus. And I'm going to tell you something that may offend your religious sensibilities. God never intended for you to have the law. The law came as a result of eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and choosing to do things on our own. And what we needed was a set of parameters because we were literally killing each other. Because the law didn't change that, did it? Did the law change it? God gave us the law and then we followed the law. We're incapable of following the law. God gave humanity the law through the nation of Israel to show us that we can't do it, to show us that we need grace and truth. You can't follow the law. You can, you can do your best and tell people to follow the law, but the Bible says that if you even say that, you're a liar. You're not following the law, right? You need grace and truth. You need Jesus. And then he says, no one has ever seen God. No one has ever properly discerned God. And he means God the Father. It is God the only Son. And your translation, uh, who is close to the Father's heart, that, um, that sort of doesn't do justice to the, to the original language. The original language is more accurately translated, who is in the bosom of the Father. Because you and Son and Spirit mutually indwell one another. They mutually indwell one another. So there is no separation in the Godhead. No one has seen God. It is God, the only Son, who is close to the Father's heart, who is in the bosom of the Father, who has made him known. Has made him known. Jesus has made the Father known. And so your knowing of the Father will always be predicated on Jesus having made him known. What has Jesus He's angry and he's mean and he wants to burn you up. But Jesus stands between you because he loves you so much. And he once in a while he takes his hyssop branch and he swirls it around in the blood on the mercy seat and he shakes it at the Father to calm him down and say, Dad, settle down. And these are my friends. Don't kill them all. And the Father says, well, I hate them. But I love you, so I won't burn them up. Is that, that's not what's going on. When, when Jesus says he's, he's showing you the Father, he is showing you, go read your New Testament. What did Jesus say about his Father? What does the Father say about Jesus? Jesus is the life of the party, right? The, the wedding at Cana, they had drunk the place dry, right? What do you think those people looked like after they had drunk up all the wine? And I know sometimes we want to say, well, you know, it was just grape juice. No, the people that were there that wrote the story used a Greek word, oinos, that only has one definition, and it's fermented wine, okay? Well, maybe it was, they were really poor, and they didn't have much wine, and they all just got, you know, a little communion cup full. That's what it was. They were taking Holy Communion, and it was just a little bit. No, it was a Jewish wedding. It was a Jewish wedding, they would have gone without food, a poor family would go without food and fast and eat crumbs long enough to save up for enough wine to have at the wedding because you had to have a lot of wine at a Jewish wedding. These people had drunk the place dry and Jesus produces 180 gallons of the best wine they had ever tasted in their life. You talk about a God of excess. We serve a God of excess. We serve a God that, that produces 180 more gallons of wine after they had drunk the place dry. We serve a God that can produce enough food out of five loaves and two fishes to feed 5,000 people and have bushel baskets of leftovers. So there's a sidebar for you. When you pray, think about that God when you pray. Don't ask for crumbs. Ask for his fullness that fills the cosmos with grace and truth and grace upon grace upon grace. So why is it so awfully important that the Word became flesh? Why wasn't it good enough to sacrifice a red heifer, burn it on an altar and sprinkle its ashes? 
to repent for the nation of Israel's sins? Why wasn't it good enough when Joseph and Mary came to the temple to make an offering that they, that they brought doves and pigeons? Why wasn't that good enough? Why wasn't it good enough to bring the paschal lamb and slaughter it and spill that spotless lamb's blood to atone for our sins? Why wasn't it good enough to bring a goat or a lamb or a dove or a bull? Because you are not a goat. You are not a lamb. You are not a bull. You are not a pigeon or a dove. You are a human being. It had to be a human being, spotless and perfect. And it just it couldn't just be that this human being died for us. This human being had to live as us and assume what we are in order to take it to the cross and put it to death. That's why the Word had to become flesh exactly like you and I. Because the unassumed is the untouched or the unhealed. I'm going to read to you from one of the giants of the faith, if not the giant of the faith. Athanasius of Alexandria was um, bishop in the church of Alexandria. He stood almost alone against the Arian heresy for over 30 years of his life. He resisted the, the Arian, uh, or I'm speaking of Arius, who taught that Jesus was a created being and not God with God. Athanasius um, is a man that I am sure a hero's welcome when he met the apostles face to face. And Peter, even the first martyr, when Bartholomew, when they met Athanasius face to face, I'm sure they were in awe of this man. So he writes um, in, in his it's his magnum opus, of the Word of God. He wrote it when he was in his early 20s, in the 4th century. And he's writing about the incarnation. He's writing about the Word being made flesh. And this is what he says. When you, you know what happens when a portrait that has been painted on a panel becomes through external stains. The art to come and sit for it likeness is drawn on the material. Even so it was with the all-holy Son of God. He, the image of the Father, came and dwelt in our midst in order that he might renew mankind made after himself and seek out his lost sheep, even as it says in the gospel, I came to seek and to save that which was lost. This also explains his saying to the Jews, except a man be born again, and he was not referring to a man's natural birth from his mother, as they thought, but to the rebirth and recreation of the soul in the image of God. Why did it have to be Jesus? And why did he have to become flesh? Because he is the son of the father. And in the son becoming flesh, he not only assumes what we are so it can be atoned for completely, but he comes as the only one who has rightly discerned the Father and can show it, can show you this relationship that you have been brought into the center of. He didn't come to show you a way to get in. He didn't come to show you a formula to work out to achieve some sort of approval by this God. He came to show you grace upon grace and to tell you, that you belong to the Father, Son, and Spirit. You always have. You always will. The Father loves you, and He likes you, and you are His beloved child. Greater example of the Blessed Trinity's love for you can be found than in the cross that we commemorate 
in our time of communion. So if you have your element, the bread and the wine, or the juice, if you prefer, we invite you um, to take communion with us. So if you would join me in a prayer, we'll, uh, we'll pray over the elements. Father, um, we're as blind as we are. We, we are completely incapable of, of how much you love us. We can't, we can't accept a favor from a neighbor. We can't accept a gift a lot of times from, from someone or even a family member or, or a church friend. Or, or a neighbor, we can't accept because we, we find it in, incomprehensible that someone would, would do, what's the catch? Lord, we're always looking for the, for the catch. What's the catch? What, what strings are attached? We can't, we can't even fathom that someone would give us a gift out of the kindness of their heart. How in the world could we ever comprehend that your son would come and die for us so that we could live in eternity with you? We confess it, Lord. And we don't ask for the impossible, that you would open our finite minds to understand something so infinite. But what we will ask for is an experience of it. A taste in the bread. A hint in the wine. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Ivan. Thank you, Sandra. All right. The body of our Lord. And his precious blood. It's life giving stuff. Well, I do appreciate you being with us. If you'd like to support what we're doing, uh, here at, at Grace Communion Hanover as we, we reach out and um, share this good. It's the best news in the cosmos. It's the best news in the whole universe. And that sounds hyper. That's okay because the, the word hyper, it comes out of New Testament Greek anyway. The first, uh, the first t person to ever use the term hyper grace was the Apostle Paul when he said, uh, where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. And that phrase, grace abounds all the more, is literally hupokaris, which means, literally translated, is hyper grace. So if you want to support hyper grace, if you want to support grace upon grace being preached, at, you can visit our website, Grace Communion Han or gchanover.org, or uh, you can text the gift to 804-409-0445. And um, we hope you'll uh, join week, uh, maybe in person if you're feeling brave. So let's conclude with one final prayer. Um, Father, I ask a special all of those who are with us today, uh, those who are here in person, those who are with us um, virtually, God, that you would, you would grant us experiences of your grace, experiences of your love, experiences of your other-centeredness more than academic knowledge. And as we, as we participate together in, in the reading of Scripture, um, uh, Father, I pray that, that there would indeed be power in the hearing of the Word. 
So we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.